All right. Well, thank you for joining us today for this timely and thought-provoking session. My name is Noala de Mina, head of the Political, Economic, and Public Affairs section at the Consulate General of Canada in Dallas. Today's session will consist of an armchair discussion between our two special guests, Jonathan Scott and Minister Stephen Gilbo. At the end of the set discussion, we will be opening the floor to questions. Please make sure to submit your questions in the chat function so we can direct them to our panelists. So before I turn over the floor to Jonathan, who will lead today's discussion, I'd like to formally introduce our guests. Our first panelist, Jonathan Scott, completed a three-year deep dive into the war being waged against renewable energy by fossil fuel utilities. His film, Jonathan Scott's Power Trip, is a story of corruption and manipulation. And if it sounds like something right out of a Hollywood script, you're right, because it is baffling to Jonathan to learn how people's rights are being taken away from them right under their nose. The film begs the question, should you be in control of how you power your life? Jonathan's hope is that people who watch the film will feel inspired in some way and join the conversation about energy access. If you haven't already watched this film, I highly recommend it. Please make sure to check out our exhibitor page for the trailer and viewing link. You'll really love it. Our second panelist is Minister of Canadian Heritage, the Honorable Stephen Guilbeault. Stephen Guilbeault serves as Canada's Minister of Canadian Heritage since 2019. And for those who are not aware, this is the equivalent of Secretary of, Her Secretary of Heritage in the United States. Minister Guilbeault has been a prominent advocate in the fight against climate change for many years. In 1993, he co-founded Equitaire, the largest environmental organization in Quebec. He also worked for Greenpeace, Cycle Capital Management, a Canadian fund dedicated to the development of clean technologies, Deloitte & Touche, as well as Copticom, a consulting firm specializing in green and social economy. As an activist and strategic advisor of dozens of governments and businesses in Canada and abroad, Minister Guilbeault is a doer who works to make a difference by building bridges and relationships. In his first year as Minister of Canadian Heritage, he was a prominent advocate for the arts and cultural sectors, which were hardly hit by the pandemic. He is also active in regulating the web giants to ensure greater equity with creators and media organizations and ensuring a safer online environment for all. It is also an, he is also an avid sportsman, I must add, and cycles his bike 12 months of the year for the last 30 years, which as a Canadian myself can attest, takes courage and stamina during the cold winter months. And most importantly, Minister Gilbo is a father of four and stepfather of two. Please join me in welcoming Jonathan Scott and Minister Stephen Gilbo. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Very exciting. I'd like Thank to point you. out, not only am I glad that I didn't follow your introduction, Minister Gilbo, because that's, <laughs> I, you're, you have a very impressive okay. career. I hope to uh, scratch even a fraction of that <laughs> in my advocacy. But I'm also, I'm, I'm impressed with the uh, cycling because I have never, it, I, I don't know if I even have the stamina to be able to cycle the distances and the, the frequency that you do. But anyway, pleasure to have this conversation with you. Thank you I wonder if you, you could uh, jump in and, and, and even explain a little bit for anyone who may not know, um, as the Minister of Canadian Heritage, what, what is Canadian Heritage? What do you cover? It's a it's a very interesting ministry in in a Canadian context. So basically, and and for most people, I'm the minister responsible for arts and culture in in, in the country. So we support artists uh, directly in terms of creation, li live performances, um, but we also support uh, artistic organizations through uh, through ver various programs, uh, either in the uh, you know, dance, theater, um, audiovisual production, broadcasting. So it's a very wide mandate. I'm also the minister responsible for for sports, uh, not professional sports, but uh, at, you know minor hockey leagues, uh, soccer, uh, basketball, and we also support our, our Olympic athletes uh, representing Ken Canada ab ab abroad. Um, I'm the minister responsible for, uh, since 2019, we have a, a new law in Canada. It's called the in Indigenous Languages Act. So we're now working hard with our Indigenous partners to, to revitalize, maintain, and support Indigenous languages. Uh, funding has increased 20, uh, tenfold since, we, since we, we, we arrived to support Indigenous languages. And finally, I'm the minister responsible for um, the implementation of uh, international human rights treaties in Canada. So it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty fulsome um, 
Full could they off. pack anything more onto your plate? <laughs> How do you even find time to cycle when they when you have so much responsibility? Do you, I feel like it, you know, it would be hard not to spread yourself thin, but seeing the, the stuff you've been able to accomplish and, and how everybody's pulled together, it's very impressive. Thanks. I cycle largely to move around. That's I, I like to, to go for, for for bike rides, but but that one of the one of my main use of my of my uh, of a bicycle is really to just move around town. Yeah, well, it's good, you know, staying healthy and and also accomplishing more than most people do in a lifetime. So, you've been. Uh, I, I was actually, uh, you know, looking into some of the the work that you had done before um, being minister and um you definitely talk the talk and walk the walk and cycle the cycle i don't know if that's even the thing but you um it, it's nice to see somebody who has you know long before being you know a public figure in in um in politics that you actually have been committed to something like this and, and making sure that you're looking out for people and innovating and finding ways um to support industry so huge huge benefit can you talk a, a little bit more about the um you were talking about how part of your role is to support innovation, but also uh, are in creative industries. What are some of the programs or what are some of the, the angles that you've taken to support innovation? And obviously a lot of innovation comes out of Canada. A lot of innovation comes out of the US and there's a lot of crossover. We're two of our biggest economies for each other. Uh, what are some of the innovations that you've you know, been behind or some exciting things that you see coming up? Um, well, clearly, we, we've seen uh, artists having to rely heavily uh, on, on the digital world to be able to perform their arts over the last year, because basically that was the only way they, they, they could do it. Um, venues were, were, were closed uh, all around the world. Uh, artists or, or organizations that uh, export their, their work abroad couldn't do it uh, anymore. So uh, we've... Uh, We've recently uh, announced uh, a new program to. We we had some some programs to, to to help artists who who wanted to to do more things online, to be able to do that. But we really beefed it up because it, it, it was becoming so important for 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 them to to do it. Um, and we've seen really interesting like new platforms uh, come online. So so that there there is you know it's less of this Zoom context where where artists are performing, but something that that looks and feel closer to, to live performance. We, we, we've seen a, a number of, uh, of initiatives uh, around that. Uh, certainly, um, I mean, we're, we're, since many, art, many artists can't perform right now, some do online, but some just can't, uh, we, we've invested, um, I mean, every artist, well, every Canadian who's lost their job uh, because of COVID-19 or who couldn't work for health reason, uh, has been supported by the Canadian government at the rate of two thousand dollars per month uh, since uh, since April uh, of uh, of last year, uh, and that support is ongoing until we we've really emerged from uh, from, from from COVID nineteen. Um, we so we're funding creation. We figured well if if they can't perform, let's let's give them money to 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 create stuff that will be on on our screens uh, in. Um, uh, in, in theaters uh, in next year or, or 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 the year the year after that, um, we we've innovated in in ways. I mean, certainly from a government, it's not an innovation per se, but for a government to to do that, we, the Canadian government is now in the business of in of ensuring production sets in Canada uh, because of, for 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 TV uh, movies. Uh, because of COVID, uh, production companies couldn't get uh, insurance in case of cancellation or uh, be because of COVID-19. So the idea was brought to us, well, the government could, could do that. And it, it wasn't obvious when I started having conversation with some of my colleagues that the federal government should get involved into the business of insurance. But it took a few months, but we, uh, we're, we're doing it. Uh, so we, we announced a uh, first tranche of, uh, of support for the industry. That money was gone in a matter of um, three, maybe four months, um, putting 30,000 people back to work, uh, more than 100 productions. So we've doubled the, uh, the amount and we've, uh, we, we've extended it. So I, I, it's not technological innovation, but certainly for a government, we're, we, can we can talk about social innovation for sure. Yeah. Well, and I think it's it's still important, and myself. So we not only do we have our shows, you know, that that we do for our renovations, Property Brothers, but we also produce a lot of other talent mm -hmm. and a lot of other shows and a lot of other genres. And you're right; it's it's been very difficult um, in in both the U.S. and Canada 
um, to figure out how can we safely get people, you know, back to work. Um, you know, everything, the new protocols, everything seems to be working, but it has been nice to see the Canadian government has been very supportive of making sure that everything's being done right. And that for those folks who cannot uh, get back to work right now, being supported, but on the technology side, it is exciting because I think we'll come out of COVID in a much better place, not just um, in entertainment and, and some of the, the new innovations that we've seen that connect artists with their audience. Um, it's pretty brilliant. We see a lot of really great stuff. Um, and a lot of that will live on beyond COVID because now, you know, an artist maybe could only reach, you know, a certain number of people in a, in a brick and mortar auditorium now could have an audience um, and, and feel more engaged um, without the costs involved in, in touring and everything else. But also on the consumer side, you know, we see it, you know, with, with our products and, and a lot of uh, companies who have, you know, products to get out to the consumer. Um, they say that there's been a spike that, you know, after COVID, there's probably going to be 50% more people who remain online and are able to buy online. And a lot of companies who have now innovated so that their products in store are available online. I think it's helped us understand the value of technology. Um, and it's the same thing with my film Power Trip that, you know, technology, I think when we look at virtual power plants and how we can mm -hmm. diversify load, that's going to be what helps for situations like in Texas where they, exactly. they had the power outage. Um, it can help us with climate. It can help us with making sure that we're, we're producing clean energy and sharing some of those resources, whether it be storage for home batteries, EVs um, and everything else. So it's exciting to see a government that believes in technology. Um, because really that's where the jobs are as well now we have incredible you know stuff coming everything that was in star trek now exists <laughs> except maybe the teleporting but we're working on that right yeah. is that that's that's something you're working on i'm sure <laughs> and i mean you're so right um you know what if every second house in in texas had its own uh sets of of solar panels on on top and a and a little battery in the house to power maybe not everything but certainly some some of the appliances that that we need the, the crisis would have been fundamentally different in and that's certainly where the world is heading i mean in a way i'm as an environmental act as a younger environmental activist i think that we like you in your documentary feared that the lobbies would would be able and we're certainly trying to, to, to kill the, the innovations that, that has brought us, you know, very, very cheap and reliable solar power and, and wind power and, and, and more and more um, battery storage. But so, so I'm glad that, that they didn't win, that they didn't, I think the, the lobbies failed and, and we are seeing now that the, the, those industries thriving around the world, creating, thousands and thousands of jobs and 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 that's what we need to do more of that certainly as as a government here in canada we have interesting programs we have an ambitious climate plan uh, we have a, one of the most ambitious uh, carbon pricing system and by 2030 it's going to be one of the two or three most ambitious carbon pricing systems in the world but you know, we, we can do better we can do more yeah and i, I think that's the big thing for me it, i want people to understand is um Misinformation is one of the most dangerous things out there. And it doesn't matter if that's in politics or if it's in you know, industry. Um, and the challenge is when it comes to renewable energy, when it comes to climate, the money put behind misinformation campaigns is no, I'm not surprised when people are confused and, and you know, they'll vote one way or another on something not fully understanding. You know, there are, there are a lot of nonprofits that are created and, and that's what I discovered, which really sort of blew my, my lid when, I found out what was really going on in energy. Um, there are no, these nonprofits that are created, you know, with names like, you know, People for Solar or Committed Citizens to Renewable Energy. And right they're to actually, energy choices or, yes. Exactly, and yes. they're created by, um, you know, generally like fossil fuel funded um, agencies who are trying to undermine the information that's out there. I don't, you know, there, there's, I'm not one of those people who, you know, thinks, all right, that's it. We got to flip a switch. It's all renewable energy right now, period. It's literally impossible. We would, our economy would collapse. We'd be back in the dark ages. It's not going to happen. But what is the transition to go there to make sure that, you know, for me, I want to know two things. What's good for the environment? What's good for people? Creating jobs is good for people. Making sure that, you know, our grandkids have clean air and clean water to breathe, uh, clean air to breathe and clean water to drink. Um, making sure that you know we're moving toward technologies that will be the future, not dumping money and subsidies into 
you know, old technologies. I mean, you look at the grid, our, our grid is a <laughs> hundred years old here, more than a hundred yeah. years old and nothing's ever changed. And that's why we're seeing in a storm, you can have an entire city knocked out of power because a tree fell and, or a lightning struck a substation or something. So there are better ways. And it, it, you know, some of that will happen in the corporate world with companies getting behind, you know, we see billions being invested in renewable energy now because nobody can deny that it, it's good for business. Um, but it also takes governments that are going to get in and say, all right, enough BS, you know, there's, there's some political posturing and whatnot, but we do understand that this is good for people. And that is the role of government, I think, is to, you know, make sure that you're taking care of, you know, having a strong economy and also making sure that you're looking out for people. I really agree with you on, on the issue of transition. I mean, one of the things we did really well, I think, in Canada. So we, we're phasing out coal. By 2030, coal will be out of the energy mix in, in, in Canada. And, and one of the things we did was we, we obviously started talking about workers, but at one point said, well, what about you know, the communities? Because of, of course you have to take care of workers, but for, for many communities in Canada, in the US, coal dependent communities, what do we do? So we actually put together a panel of, of people from the industry, uh, trade unions, uh, non-governmental uh, non organizations, and we, we went to, to see those communities and we said, okay, listen, we're, we're doing this. Like, 10 years from now, there'll be no more coal. What, what can we do to help you? What does it mean for you as a worker? What does it mean for you as a community? How, how do we make this transition happen? And I think that's what we need to do on, 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 on oil uh, and, and natural gas. And I can certainly understand from the perspective of someone who's, who works in the oil industry and who's being told, well, you know, we're, we're moving out of that business, you can go, holy moly, you know, what's going to happen to me? And, and un yeah. until I, I think we as government have a responsibility to, to, to do that, to work with these people, to work with these communities, to say, okay, well, listen, this is, this is the plan. Let's, let, let, let's develop the plan together. We may not have all the answers, but for, if we start working together, I think we can figure it out. Yeah, and I, I think that's so important. It's not a us versus you kind of a thing. We're, we're in this all together, literally, we're in this together. Um, and, and I think that was the crazy thing. You know what? my grandfather was a coal miner and he died of black lung and, mm -hmm. and, you know, related to working in the coal mines. And when I was interviewing coal miners in Kentucky, you know, a lot of these towns are dying. The people are literally dying and yeah. the economies are dead. And, you know, a lot of times they think, well, you know, they, they're blaming it on, you know, the government, you know, shutting down jobs. And it's, it's really, it's not that when you look at the human health effects and the cost of, it, of what it is they never show you that when they show you the the cost to generate you know solar electricity wind electricity uh, geothermal whatever it's going to be versus coal or you know nuclear natural gas they never show you the after effect costs of what those other energies um have and it's it's pretty crazy but seeing that there are you know organizations who are now trying to transition those workers to you can't vilify people who work in in fossil fuels because they're the backbone of the economy they're what built us to where we are today and i think it's very important that we help protect those folks and find a new path and a better way but what was really enlightening for me to see it took me 3 years to film power trip and when i started there were still in in america there were 20 uh, over 20 new coal power plants that were either being built or were currently being bid out to build. And by the end of my film, because of these grassroots organizations, because mm -hmm. of these, you know, governments have stepped in and at local at the local level and said, this isn't right. By the end of my film, all 20 plus of those projects were abandoned, shut down, canceled, because everybody knows that not only is it more expensive to generate a coal power plant and to generate coal power, but it's also you have all these health effects and the environmental effects and it's just not worth it. So what's, what's a better path? And, and I think now the general consensus, at least I saw, it didn't matter what side of the political aisle someone was on. Everybody believed that clean energy, renewable energy was a good thing. We want to find a way to make sure that it's simple and it's cost effective everywhere. Because really the cost is different province to province, state to state. Yeah. There's got to be a way to simplify I know I, I could talk your ear off and ask a million <laughs> questions. And Noella, jump in when, you, when I need to shut up. Uh, but I, I did want to find out from you because um, it is a very challenging thing when you're intersecting, you know, energy and the economy and the environment. What would you say is like the number one thing right now that is, is either really promising or really scary that we need to watch out for? What, what's something that you do to sort of tackle that intersection? 
For me, as someone who started working on climate change in the early 90s, um, I'm, it's amazing to see the level of engagement we're seeing, the level of awareness. Um, I mean, with certainly so refreshing with the Biden administration. There was a recent meeting between uh, a number of the, the President Biden and his different secretaries, the vice president was there and the Canadian government, the prime minister, a number of ministers, and everybody was talking about climate change. Our minister of transportation was talking about, about climate change. Your secretary of, of transportation was talking about climate change. The vice president was talking about climate change, the prime minister. Um, and, and we're seeing this happening all around, all around the world. So it's no longer a question of, you know, do we need to do something about it? It's, it's, a, it's, it's a matter of, okay, let's roll up our sleeves and let gets, we can do this. We can get the job done. We can work together, people, business, government, let, 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 let's get this done. Climate doesn't have to be a dirty word. That's, that's the big thing for me. I'm like, it should be exciting that people are doing something that's going to perpetuate a strong economy and perpetuate exactly. a clean environment. So it, it's exciting that I think, I would say solar is sexy. <laughs> I love it. You know, let's find Me out too. other innovations like that. I think the next major revelation, uh, the, or the next major revolution is, is going to be storage. When we kind of crack that storage nut and yeah. figure out what the next iteration, that's going to be pretty incredible. Noelle, you have questions? All right. I'm jumping in. I'm cutting you off, even though it's such a great conversation. I think we could listen for hours, but thank you for that. So we're going to put you guys in the We also rehearsed a song. We, were, we have a song that we wanted to do <laughs> and, for and everybody. And a dance. And a dance. Yeah, exactly. really I have good at dancing. <laughs> So we'll put you in the hot seat for about 10 minutes. We were starting to get some questions, but I'll start you off with one question. Uh, so I'll start off with Jonathan. Um, I love your movie. Um, I think it was really great. And, and you mentioned that it started off as an environmental uh, issue. And then you noticed it was a social issue and then a people's issue, right? A personal issue. Uh, so again, people, the, explain to us a little bit as a property brother, again, what inspired you to get on this journey for energy and, and what really motivated you to dig into this? So I grew up on a ranch and um, we were, my, my parents taught us, you know, that we needed to be stewards of the environment, always make sure we're cognizant, uh, you know, taking care of the animals and, the, and our property and everything. Um, and so that was just sort of ingrained in me growing up in, you know, on the edge of the forestry, um, just outside of Vancouver. And then eventually when I moved to Calgary, I, I attended the University of Calgary. And I remember my very first home, my first home that I bought, um, I opted to power it with wind. And that was, you know, something that was important. I was paying a little bit more and it was fairly new to use wind power, but that carried with me, you know, fast forward, uh, you know, 11 years, I moved to, to Las Vegas and I was, you know, doing our show and I was putting solar on my home in Vegas. Now at that time, I didn't know a lot about photovoltaic cells and the technology behind it, but it felt like the right thing to do. And I was met with so much uh, frustration from the utility, um, delays, caps on what I could do. They had all these weird rules to limit how much uh, energy I could produce on my own. And I'm the guy, you know, I was a debater in college when if something just smells weird or it doesn't look right, I will go to the nth degree to figure out why. So I, I hired a researcher and I dug in and I realized that there were these active efforts to kill, you know, rooftop solar and, and net metering and whatnot, which is happening again in California right now. And, um, that's when I, I dug in and I wrote this, the film and I thought it was going to be a film that was just going to bust all these myths about what's happening in renewable energy. And as I traveled around the country and I interviewed hundreds of people from every walk of life, I realized it was a human story. We're all affected exactly the same by this. Other people are trying to tell us that it's a partisan issue or that it's, you know, a city versus country. It's not. It literally affects us all the same. And I, that's the message that it ended up being with the film to show people what they can do. Great. And we have no and time left. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fantastic. And I think you really encapsulated well when you said like, we may not have the answers, but we're all in it together. And I think that's really, really clear. And I think your, your, your film really does a great job of really uh, getting the gamut, right? And getting different views across the country. And I think that's really great. Um, and so the, the one thing I'll add to, to what you were just saying that, that I think is really important for people to understand is um, that, you know, you see a lot of people that use this dirty word called subsidy, that they think, you know, solar, it's a subsidy, and it couldn't be further from the truth. It, the renewable energy actually does have a value. And when you look at what happened in Texas recently, that's exactly what it is. And just because, you know, uh, the wind facilities that were there that were not built for cold weather, there are actually wind towers that are built for cold weather, Canada knows. And, yeah, exactly. um, but that, that sort of diversification in energy 
um, it's something we can plan toward and it can actually be the solution that prevents that from happening as opposed to people thinking that it's something that's you know a dirty subsidy and it's taking away from you know everybody else's use in the grid there's a wind park 25 kilometers south of here that operates 12 months a year under minus 30 minus 35 sometimes minus 40 degrees celsius uh, can condition now i don't know what can never do the calculation to fahrenheit but it's cold minus 40 is cold like it's really cold yeah well my, fahrenheit and celsius meet at minus what 40 or 42, something like that. So yeah, it's very cold. <laughs> Thanks for that. So maybe the next question I'll direct it to uh, Minister Gilbo. Um, again, you have over 30 years, again, in, in environment and climate action, and really, like, it, it really seems that it's something from the heart. Uh, so again, we always say we don't have, we have one planet, there's no planet B. Um, it looks a little bit grim, like Jonathan mentioned earlier, when you start off the movie, it looks very grim, but he ends at a positive note. What's your hope for the future? Um, and what do you think, these, like, we're, we're really on a good footing right now in terms of Canada and U.S. discussions, in terms of climate change, and the U.S. rejoining the, climate, uh, the Paris Climate the Paris Agreement? Accord. Um, exactly. Um, how do you see this shaping out and what are your hopes for the future? I'm, I mean, I'm rather optimistic about the future. I think we, we will be able to, to, to solve this. Um, as Jonathan said, it, you know, it, it, it's not about politics, or at least it shouldn't be. And in, in most places in the world, it's not. It seems that North America, only right-wing parties in North America haven't caught up to the fact that it's not about politics, on, on, unfortunately, on both sides of, uh, of the border. But you go in many different countries, you have parties to the right that are, are advocating for, for, for climate action with, with, with their own different political lens, but, the, but there's no debate about whether or not we, we, we should be acting. Uh, so that, that give, gives me great hope. I mean, when I look at where, where we started 30 years ago and, and where, when we are now in terms of climate action, things are really starting to pick up. Um, I mean, we've been talking about renewable energy, storage. We could be talking about um, uh, electrification of, of transportation. Um, more and more countries are adopting laws to phase out the internal combustion engine. In the case of Norway, it's going to happen in 2025. For other countries, it's going to be 2030, 2035. But I'm convinced that 10 years from now, um, no one will be buying an uh, internal combustion engine anymore. We will have moved to a fully electric and more and more uh, autonomous transportation system. Uh, we're investing massively here on, on, on public transit as well, as well as active transportation. Um, if we want people to use their bikes to, to walk more, well, they need to have good infrastructures to, 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 to do that in, in our cities across North America. And that's certainly, you know, it's not high tech, it's actually really low tech, but it's super important. So I'm, I, I am very hopeful. At the same time, we have to be extremely honest with, with each other. Like we, we've entered the, the era of climate change, what we've seen in Texas, uh, a number of the, the things that we've, we've seen in, in terms of hurricanes uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, forest fires in, in Canada, uh, heat waves, like we're in it. So we have to, not, we, we have to get ready for that. We have to, to adapt and to prepare ourselves for these things that we thought could only happen uh, you know, every, every 100 years are starting to happen every, every 20 years, every 10 years. So we have to work really hard to phase out fossil fuels, and, and this is happening. But at the same time, we have to, to, get, to get ready because it, we, are, we are being hit by climate change and, it, and climate change will be upon us for a while. But if we work hard and if we, do our, uh, if we do what we have to do well, then our kids and grandkids will inherit a, a planet that is, they'll be more healthier than the one Jonathan and I in, inherited from, from our parents. So we have this, it's both a, a, a really cool opportunity and a responsibility at the same time. And I think the whole world is looking to, you know, the U.S. and Canada to be leaders and, and to showcase, you know, that, you know, it's not just coming from the top down. It's everybody supporting what is good for industry, what is good for the environment. And um, that's that I agree with you. It's the exciting thing is, is to know that now we're kind of beyond that myth where for the longest time it was like, this is bad for business. It's not bad for business. We know that now. So let's find a way to make sure that, you know, it, it can catch on and we can support this new innovation. Great. So we'll take one last question. And we received a question regarding the Navajo Nation. 
Um, and Jonathan, I think that was like in the, uh, when building on the point of generation, um, generation, future generations that the minister just mentioned. I think the Navajo, the peace with the Navajo Nation really kind of was emblematic of that and that sentiment of really leaving something positive to the future generations. Could you talk to us a little bit about your main takeaways from that and if there's anything like any best practices or something that's inspiring that maybe you could leave the audience with? Yeah, and, and I think it, it's shocking to a lot of people to realize that within our own borders, there are thousands and thousands of homes that do not have access to electricity, that do not have access to clean water. Um, and it's mind blowing. You know, you always think of that is, is this a, a third world problem? Is it somewhere else? And no, it's right here at home. And so the Navajo Nation <clears throat> for the longest time, and I filmed, I actually went back a couple of times because um, they noticed that they had a problem. They were buying all of their energy from power plants and it was coal produced energy. And all of that money was leaving the nation and going elsewhere. And, and they also were not, it was not good for the environment and they knew that. And it's very important to the Navajo people to make sure that they're stewards of, of the land. And so they decided in a very bold move that they were gonna start, they were gonna get in the generation business. They were gonna generate their own. They built um, Kienta One, which was a massive solar field and they hired, their own people, they run it themselves. All of that money is directly invested back into the community. And it was a very emotional journey for me to see people who had never had power before. Maybe the kids got power when they went to school or somebody at work, but when they went home, they didn't have power. And for the first time, flicking on that light and, and having access to something that the rest of us take for granted is very moving. And it was so successful that they launched, within the period of my film, they launched Kianta 2 and it was, this just goes to show that we're moving in the right direction because the exact same kilowatt hour output of the secondary facility ended up being much smaller because the technology of photovoltaic panels has improved. So it takes up less space and the cost was substantially lower. So you can see this trend that as the, the cost comes down and more interest is in the renewable energy, all of a sudden it's going to become second nature. In reality, you know, I thought it was, it was really special, you know, we have a five-year-old and, and she wrote a letter to her Senator the other day saying, um, we need to be careful because we're polluting the air and that is killing the birds and it's hurting the environment. And I, for me, I was like, I'm so proud at five years old that you're doing what I feel like there are a lot of people who are 50 years old that don't get it. <laughs> should yet. be doing. <laughs> uh, yeah, and so I, I think we're gonna see this continue to grow in the next generation. They're gonna teach us a thing or two about what it means to really be stewards of the environment. Fantastic. So um, this is really incredible. Thank you so much for this discussion. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but thank you again. We'll be sharing this video for those that couldn't join us today on our main South by Southwest platforms, as well as our consulate general pl uh, platforms as well on social media and Facebook. So thank you again, Jonathan, on behalf of everybody at the consulate general, thank you for taking the time and having this discussion with us. We hope to welcome you back on some other energy panels and hopefully maybe next year we can have you and Minister Guilbeault in person at South by Southwest. Minister Guilbeault, un gros merci de la part de, de, des gens du Consulat Général du Canada à Dallas. Merci infiniment. So thank you again, and I wish everybody a great afternoon. Thank you. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.